If you're seeking an encounter with the other side, there is one place unlike any other. Winchester, Indiana is home to the Randolph County Infirmary, a retired poor farm known to the paranormal community as one of the most haunted places in America. Eager to learn more about this highly regarded location, Connor and I met with Ted, a local historian and tour guide. This is the Randolph County Infirmary. In later years, it changed its name to Countryside Care Center because let's face it, if you call your building an asylum or an infirmary, you're not gonna get very many people to volunteer to come live here. And if you're thinking that there's gonna be doctors and nurses out here and stuff, there isn't any. You've got a caretaker and his wife and their family. This place was established in 1851. Now this was established as a poor farm. It was never meant to be anything medical or mental, never. And if you've got a mental problem or a physical problem, you automatically qualify to live here. So there's lots of mental and physical problems here to begin with from the very start. The first building was built right on this very same foundation we're on right now, and it was made out of wood. And yes, the first building did indeed burn down. It burnt down in 1857. It had lasted for four and a half years before they accidentally burned it down. And there was no one killed in the fire. So today, we don't have any little crispy critter spirits flying around in here because of that. Now the other building was built right here across the driveway in that green lot over there where you guys parked. And they're gonna build this so quick, they're not even gonna order bricks or anything. They're gonna make them here on site. When you make a brick, you have to get it to 15 to 1700 degrees in order for it to get the glaze on it to make it waterproof. Otherwise, it's not waterproof at all. So from day one, when they're building this place over here, the building's actually starting to melt already every time it rains. Now it does last for several years. In 1892, I've got records up there at the museum that states where the ladies living in the west end of the building Whatever it rain or snow or high winds like today, they were stripping their bedclothes like quilts and blankets and pillows and stuff like that and stuffing them in the walls where there's holes in the wall and especially around the windows where the brick have all melted out from around the windows. So the windows are basically trying to fall out. And so what one of the little commissioners decided to do was they looked over here and seen this burned out foundation that's right here from the very first building. And he said, why don't we go over there and shore up that old foundation and let's engineer a brand new building and build it out of brick so it don't burn down and let's do it right this time and we'll increase the size of the foundation as we go, as we need it. And that's what they did, and that was this building that you're in right now. January of 1898, they started this building, and by December of 1899, it was just one month short of being two years, this building was done. And people walked across the yard and occupied it, and it ran until 2006 when it closed its doors forever. There was 1,487 people, including the caretakers and their families that went through this building the time it was open. One of the things I used to get asked about this time was how many people died here. I don't know, I don't have a clue. People come here and swear that this was one of the most haunted places they've ever been. And we did make number 10 in the United States. So yes, there really is stuff here. Now in 1938, there was a woman that was put in here by her son. There's no other polite way to say it. Her name is Ida Gunkel, and she's nuts. That's being as polite as I can be about it. 
eight years before she was put in here by her son, her husband passed away. And her husband, you know what he passed away from? He had syphilis. And so Ida's got syphilis, and it's eating her brain up. That's why she's nuts. And two years before she was put in here by her son, her oldest and favorite daughter passed away. And that was the trigger that put Ida over the top. It really was. She's really off the wall now. So son tried to take her home and take care of her and couldn't handle her. Well, now, by this time, this place has so many mentally handicapped people here that it is known as an asylum. And so son thought he was doing her a favor by bringing her here where she can get what he thought was professional care. And actually, she thought all he was doing was dumping her. When Ida's here, she's got a room right down the hall down here, and most of the time she's fine. Other times she comes running and screaming and crying out of her room, ripping at her clothes, messing down her legs, and then getting down in the floor and rolling in it. In the basement, there was one room down there that had bars in the window, and nobody had any idea what these bars were for but they know what they're gonna do with it now. So they take all of Ida's stuff down there, her bunk and all of her clothes and everything, and they put her in this room. Now they never lock the door on her in the daytime, never. But at night, that's a different story. She's locked in every night. Mrs. Thornburg, who was the matron at the place, her job every night was to lock her door to make sure she's in there. So Mrs. Thornburg one night came walking down the hall down there in the basement to lock her in, and Ida asked her for a broom. Well, she's in the basement, it's probably dirty, she probably needs a broom. So Mrs. Thornburg goes and gets her a broom and hands it in to her, pulls her door shut, locks it, and Mrs. Thornburg comes up and goes to bed. 5.30 the next morning, Mrs. Thornburg gets up to go down and unlock her door so Ida can get breakfast, and she opens the door, and Ida is hanging from that broom, and she is dead. This is the room Ida hung herself. She took the cloth off her mattress and tied it around this, and it's hanging down here. And so she stands on her bunk, and the bunks here are taller than what you would imagine. When she stands on her bunk, her head's above these pipes. Mm -hmm. And she took that cloth and tied it around her neck and then stepped off. And no, it didn't break her neck, I'm sure. Because when she was found the next day, her feet was on the floor, and she's leaning forward to a 45 degree angle. Now you got people here that really feel sorry for her, mm -hmm. which I do too. And so they bring her wreaths and flowers and stuff like that. Now Ida is still in here. Now yes, there is electricity up there, but it doesn't work. Yeah. So your K2 meters, when they go off in here, is her responding to you. Okay, okay she pegs them and goes clear red, okay. So we'll move on down. All right, now we're gonna go about a year on down the road and there's a retired judge that shows up here. And he talks to Studi, who was the caretaker here at that time, and says, hey, the United States is getting ready to be in another big world war. And you're gonna have some guys here that you're not going to like and you're gonna have trouble with. So him and Studi go to Winchester to the jail and they buy a jail cell. And in 1940, they put the jail cell in up here in a room on the second floor, and it's still here today. There you go. Jail cell. There's your jail cell. Had to put it in there in the 1940s. Right there's a good place to try to sleep tonight. Nick Groth on Paranormal Lockdown spent his second night in there. Really? Said it was the longest night he'd ever spent any place. And to everybody's advantage, that padlock does not unlock. So you can't close anybody in there. Right. And if you can, we don't have a key to that lock. You may be there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and it was almost like the judge was a prophet. He knew exactly what he was talking about. 
back during that time period, there was a draft, and not everybody got drafted. You had guys that were blown out alcoholics. So now you got four guys from Randolph County that didn't get drafted and got sent home. And think about it. If the Marines and the Army don't even want you at a time of war, you're pretty much scum. Nobody wants you. So the county had to take them in. And believe me, they were thugs. They were guys like in today's prisons that you better be nice to or listen to or you might not wake up the next day. Three guys that lived on their floor up there that didn't like them and was causing them a bad time. And over the next couple of years, over not all at once, but strung out, one of these guys wouldn't come down for breakfast one morning and they'd go looking for them and they'd find them still in bed with pillows over their faces. There was a little 11-year-old girl, or her name is Doris Addington, that was left on the front steps right out here by her sisters. Now her story is, is her mom and dad used to live here, and all three of these sisters were born here. And in later times down the road, they got on their feet and they bought a property down at Lynn and they all moved down there. But the Addington's mom and dad in 1938 or nine were killed in a car accident. And so here's these three little girls and they're not really that little anymore, just the ones, a little girl. And they all want to be adopted but they don't think the youngest one, Doris, will be adopted because when she was a real little girl wandering around out back out here, she got kicked in the head by a mule and it messed her speech up. She can't talk plain. So these two older sisters didn't think she would ever be adopted. So they were familiar with this place, naturally. So they brought her here and dumped her on the front steps and then went away and left her. So. When the caretakers open the door, of course they know who she is, and she's not treated any differently than anybody else. He said, Doris, do you want to help us work here, or do you want to just play in the room all day long? Well, naturally, they thought Doris would help them clean. She didn't want to help clean. She wanted to cook. In later years, Doris turned into be a tremendous cook. I knew her personally, by the way. Doris is a great lady. She's a sweetheart. She really is. She helped cook the meals here three times a day for several years. Doris passed away in this building right down the hall in a room down there. And Doris was 81 years old. So Doris cooked in this place for 70 years. She lived here for 70 years. And I'm telling you, she is a sweetheart. And she will talk to you. This is the kitchen that Doris worked in for 70 years. All right, you see the flowers? Doris loves flowers. And right there's a picture of Doris. Your spirit boxes can sit right here, and your tape recorders, and she'll talk, you can sit right here and she'll talk to you. And if you get somebody that talks a little rough to you, it's probably Ida and not Doris, okay? Now, paranormal lockdown when Nick Groth and Katrina Weidman were here. The first night, Nick's bunk was right here. Nick's in here and he's just about asleep and he hears a noise in here and can't figure out what it is. He gets up looking and can't find it. So he gets Katrina and Grant down here and they're walking around and finally they figured out what it was. It's this thing right here. It went like that. Wow. And that's what woke him up. Wow. That takes a lot of force to do that. Yeah. But that is what they heard. I heard that, whatever that was. Yeah, what? a woman? Who's here? Who's here? Doris, is that you? Well, we're going that way. Oh, yeah. We, I, I, wow. That I sounded like it. a... Yeah, a woman. Yeah, I heard it too. What the heck was that? Okay. 
I promise you folks, you won't you will not be disappointed here tonight. Yeah. But that is what you heard. I heard that, whatever that was. What? Yeah. But that is what you heard. I heard that, whatever that was. What? She is indeed still here. Now, Doris had one quirk, which is kind of a funny thing. She loved dolls. In every room she was in when she lived here, her dolls went with her. She collected dolls. Her dolls were in there with her when she died. And we get so many people out here that just can't stand to be around dolls. So I've added a little thing that's kind of humorous to lighten the air up in there. All right, you've seen the conduit come down the walls to plug in that are on the wall. I took a Barbie doll and stuck her on that conduit and made a pole dancer out of her. And I took a dollar and folded it up and stuck it down her front. And this is the room that Doris Addington died in. Remember me telling you she liked dolls? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all of these dolls right here and all of them on the shelves are hers. And now, I get a lot of people that spooked about dolls. So there you go. There's Barbie. Ooh, Barbie. Barbie's made $18 so far. Somebody's got to work in these places. <laughs> there was a toilet. This is a sit room. Doris died in here. She actually died of H1N1. This is set up. If you're a tall person oh, and you bump that foot right there, mm -hmm. that dog Hello? Will... What Do you guys not hear that? No. There was a, a woman just talking. I thought it was the pizza person. Hello? I'll go see if the pizza's here. It was a woman talking. Hold on. I don't see nobody down there. My guess, you either heard Doris or Ida. And it's not here yet. Ida's seen her. She, they, they come right on in. Mm -hmm. I have been hearing talking this entire time that Ted has been giving us a walkthrough and through an interview. So this is really, really weird. We're going to this room. Now, there's a little eight-year-old boy in here, and his name is Noah. I don't know his last name, but he's in here with his mother, and it's 1943 and he's got the old-fashioned measles, and it killed him. So we started getting him toys. And the only one I've ever seen move is this one right here. See how it's got a stop on it? Mm -hmm. We'd take, I take that stop and set it right there on a crack, and then I go about my own business doing things and come back and check it. And one time, it had rolled forward one round and was up there, but he's still here. That's why there's a chair in here. You can communicate with Noah. All right, India. So we are in front of the Randolph County Infirmary here in Winchester, Indiana. And we are about to start an investigation. We just got done with our interview with Ted and this place is really, really scary. We had some really weird stuff going on doing our interview, hearing a woman talk, hearing some noises, and uh, I'm pretty anxious about filming at this place. I feel like you have a bad vibe about this place. I do have a bad vibe about this place. There's just something about this place that just makes me feel uneasy. Is it because we heard the woman earlier? Maybe because we heard the woman down in the kitchen area, down the stairs in the basement. And this one just makes me feel really uncomfortable. I'm kind of really nervous about this place tonight. I hope it's going to be good. I don't want to say that I feel like we'll get a lot of activity because I, I think that curses it. If you say that, and we'll get nothing. So I don't know what to expect, but let's see. Let's go in there and see. I'm really ready to get in here. Okay, everybody, this is 
paranormal encounters at the Randolph County Infirmary? Let's go. Oh my gosh, it's so dark. I know it is. I can't see anything. Hi everybody. My name is India. And this is Connor. And we've just come to spend the evening with you tonight. This is Ida's room. Hello, Ida. Just want to come sit with you for a minute and talk to you if that's okay. Okay, Ida, I don't know if, there's a chair right there, Connor, if you want to sit down. I don't know if you uh, know what this is, but it's just a little machine that makes it easy for us to talk to you. So if you touch it, if you touch that little antenna that's sticking up, we will be able to know that you're here because it's gonna light up a different color and make a noise. If you could come forward and talk to us, we would really appreciate it and we could maybe talk to you um, about what you would like us to know about yourself. I have a voice recorder on the floor and if you speak into the little orange light, we'll be able to hear your voice. Are you here with us right now? Did you hear something? How do you feel about the fact that there's still a broom in this room? Did it upset you that your son dropped you off here? I'm sorry that happened. Can you come near this red light so we know that you're in here with us? What was it like in here for you? Do they treat you okay in here? Anybody here? If you're here, can you make a noise?
Can you do it again? There we go. Can you make a really loud noise? Something just moved back there. Is this the is that the kitchen? I think so, yeah. Doris, is that you? Are you in the kitchen? You're making something for dinner? Are you in here, Doris? My name is India and this is Connor. And we heard that you're a really good cook. We were down here earlier with Ted and during our interview, um, we actually heard like, what sounded like a woman when we were talking about Doris. Doris, if you're in here, you can touch that red light and it's gonna let us know that you're in here too. We really would like to talk to you tonight. I'm going to leave a little voice recorder as well. So, if you would like to talk to us. Can you say hi, Doris? This is you right here. This is a picture of you, isn't it? How old were you when you came to Randolph? Noise or say something. We thought we heard you earlier.
sorry not to feel good down there. Huh? I was sorry not to feel good. I was literally starting to feel sick. After investigating the basement, I began feeling unwell and I needed a break. India wanted to continue the investigation and went upstairs to see if she could get in contact with the men who used to call the infirmary home. Okay, if there's anybody in here, my name is India. And I just want to talk to you tonight if that's okay with you. Can you tell me what your name is? I've been told there were a bunch of men in here who like causing trouble. Are you in here still? So many noises coming from down there. I can't tell if it's the wind or not. What I'm going to do is just take some flash photos, just to see if I can get anything. As India was unable to capture any evidence and I was feeling better, we made our way to the doll room to pay Doris a visit. We decided that this would be a good place to set up the portal to try and hear her voice. So right now we're going to be doing a portal session in Doris's room. And India is looking at one of her dolls right now to pick it out and see if we can use it as a trigger object. While we try to ask questions and attempt to communicate with her. I'll use... which one do you think? This one? Sure. Ready? Yeah. Are you with us in here? Does this one have a name? It was at this time that my camera audio captured what sounds like a woman trying to say something. This voice did not come through the portal as it cannot be heard on the camera sitting on the shelf or on India's microphone. Could this be Doris trying to tell us the name of her doll?
Is there somebody in the room with us in here? Me. I heard me. I was going to say that. Me. It's me. What's your name? Can you tell me whose room we're in? What doll is that? What's his name? Is Doris in this room with us? Did you hear that? We heard you or we heard you? That was clear. That didn't even sound like it came from there. Yes, sir. Did you hear that one? Uh-huh. Who are we talking to right now? play with you for a little bit. So if you want to come play with us, I have this new toy. It's really cool. All you have to do is go up to it like this and it'll do that. It'll light up and it will show you all the pretty colors and you can come play with me if you want to do that. Is it okay if I do some coloring? If you want me to draw something, can you press that little red light? Can you go up to it and touch it? I'm going to try and draw a flower even though I cannot see anything in the dark. I'm drawing a flower for you. Ooh, what oh, what was that? Was yeah. that lightning? I don't know. Was that lightning? I'm not sure. I was looking away for a second. That just filled the whole room. Yeah, I don't know if that was the light from the REM pod or if that was That outside. wasn't the light from the REM pod, it was a white flash. With India drawing pictures and myself not paying attention, we had no idea that the REM pod had just gone off. India was convinced the flash she had just seen was lightning. Whatever was in the room with us was about to tell her otherwise. I mean, I guess we'll know if, if we see some more lightning. Yeah, because I was looking away. I wasn't I'm not You sure. didn't see that? That filled the whole room. I did see it. That's why I looked at the REM pod. I wasn't... I don't think it... <laughs> Well, I'm going to finish drawing my flower. I can't really see.
Can you come over here and sit with me? If that wasn't lightning, <laughs> that had to have been. That was so weird. That had to be lightning. Okay, there's no other lightning. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm literally looking. I think that was the light, the REM pod. It wasn't the REM pod. It that filled my whole vision. It me too. That's what I'm trying to figure out what, what it was. See? It's the REM pod. Yeah. Hi, Noah, is that you? Is that you, Noah? Okay, if it's, if it's Noah, can you make that light up? Noah, can you light it up? Whoa. What? Well, someone touched my finger for a second. Oh, Hello? So if you're a male, can you light that up for me? If you're a female, can you light it up? This is the first time I've seen the REM pod go off in a very long time. I know. I'm trying to get you, the window, and the REM pod. Are you just testing it out? Are you just playing with it? It's not going to hurt you, I promise. I know that the, the flash is kind of startling. As the building seemed to quiet down, we called it a night and set up two cameras to roll while we were asleep. One camera was placed covering Noah's room while the other shot the staircase in the entry hall. The following clips are what we captured while we were sleeping. Though the bodies of the former residents have long gone, it's evident that the Randolph Infirmary still holds some part of those who called it home. You can almost still see Doris in her kitchen, or Noah playing with his toys, or an old man looking across the farm as he rocks gently in his chair. Maybe they're still living their lives, and we are simply witnessing the memories of time. No matter how much evidence we capture, or how many places we go to, we know that we'll never be able to prove the continuation of our existence after we die. Some things have to be experienced to be believed. If you're looking to find your own paranormal encounters, spend a night inside the Randolph County Infirmary and let the building make a believer out of you.